and now we are live. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Thank Olga. Our conversation with <laughs> David, we, we are so happy to have you again. Uh, David, I had fantastic conversations with you um, before. And for those who don't know David's uh, teaching and life path, I really want you to do research during his Facebook page. He has a lot of wonderful content that you really enjoy. And today, I thought it would be great, uh, David, if we have conversation about the subject that I think so valuable especially in today's environments we have election coming up we have so many different conflicts on social media that i can observe every day arguments it feels like people have compassion fatigue don't you find it that sometimes it feels like all signs pointing it's compassion fatigue <laughs> mm. um david tell me what is your work in bringing compassion to everyday routine of every human being no matter what state of awareness a person has uh whether they had experience that we were so blessed to have you me and many other people the experience of awakening the, the experience of seeing beyond body mind what what is that that you can share that is relevant well my work centers on the idea and the experience that, that there's really one of us, we share, we are all connected, we share one mind, and that uh, the belief in separation has projected out a world of differences, but, but the, the core disturbance is in the in mind, in consciousness. So everything that I work with is on healing the consciousness, healing the mind, and then seeing the world in a way where you radiate the love that's already inside of you to everyone and everything. So compassion is a very interesting uh, topic because a lot of times there are many, many spiritualities that, that will say you need to have compassion towards ignorance and compassion towards suffering and compassion towards uh, conflict and so forth. And from my teachings, it's that you must find the source of the conflict, of the suffering, of the all uh, differences in mind and consciousness before you can truly extend love. So if you believe that, that you are not a part of the suffering, but you still perceive other people suffering, I would say you are deluded, you are mistaken, because you can't even perceive conflict and perceive suffering unless you actually believe it. It's unconscious. Usually the mind is not aware of, of how deep the beliefs uh, in ego are rooted. But if you are perceiving the suffering and trying to act compassionately, it's going to be a very difficult struggle and it will bring fatigue and it will bring like a burnout that you mentioned because in one sense, uh, you're saying, I'm perceiving it, I have nothing to do with it, but I'm going to send love to it. And uh, if you're perceiving it, you believe it. You actually already do believe it. And so really, as soon as you perceive the conflict and the suffering in whatever, in politics or in uh, different cultures and so on and so forth, then you have to come back inside and say, I need healing in my perception to actually experience the love that's in my heart. So it's quite, it's quite a, a journey to clear, clear the consciousness completely. What difficulties did you uh, did or do experience in relation to compassion? Because, you know, in the interaction between human beings, sometimes so many triggers can happen. And um, as, I, as I listen, a lot of other people who had experiences of awakening, uh, the, the, the body-mind awareness still, still exists even after the experience itself, as the intensity of it subsides for a lot of people, probably for majority of people. The reconstruction into the ego happens, and it's almost, I, I see in my world, the intensity of experiences of emotion became much stronger before the experience itself happened. It seems like 
the, because we, we became more open to, to feeling everything that the body is there to feel, you almost feel even most, more, I cannot say suffering per se, but the, the pains of the emotions that are perceived to be painful, you feel it stronger. And I can, can see that it's relevant to a lot of other people. I, yesterday, I just, I just listened to some um, Adishanti conversation and some other uh, teachers and sages. It feels like it's it's very common denominator, I don't know how it's in your world, that the, after the experience of awakening, the experience that of the unified consciousness, when you get reintegrated as a human being per se, <laughs> or perceived to be such, the emotions become almost stronger. They're not disappearing. People have this imagination that maybe some cases, I don't know, it's not my situation. I cannot, I cannot share it because there's no experience on my end that there is something happening to your emotional world when everything becomes this nirvana and peace. No, you just have different relationship with emotions. But the experience of suffering then become not so personal any longer. You don't, you don't suffer, you, you, you feel the pain, yet there is not this existential suffering or depression or believing in the emotions any longer. There is observer to that. But through suffering, of our own, as we experience it, it's much easier to come back to relating to other beings that go through their own struggle, isn't it so? Well, I think there are many pathways to awakening, but I would say a purely awake mind does not suffer at all, ever. Uh, there's not an observer of the suffering, it's just there is no suffering. Because actually spirit or love or oneness doesn't create any kind of conflict or suffering. It all it always comes from ego. So when people say I'm I'm I had an awakening experience, they maybe had a glimpse right. of something. They had a glimpse of the divine, we'll say, but they didn't they didn't actually fully awaken from the ego. If if the suffering or even the perception of suffering comes back, uh, even if they're observing the suffering, it's still there is no suffering in God. So I actually studied A Course in Miracles, which is from Jesus Christ, and there, here we have a totally awake being, someone who, who seemingly was on the cross, and he basically had blood coming from his limbs, and he said, forgive them, for they know not what they do in a calm way. He, he actually did not have any pain on the cross. Uh, a lot of times people in this day and age, they see people that can use the power of their mind to walk across hot coals and not feel pain, or they even walk across hot coals and their feet don't even get burned. Well, this was Jesus Christ. He had transcended. He doesn't need hypnotism. He had actually reached the point where he, he saw the ego wasn't real and death wasn't real. And so we had a man who seemed to come back after he was buried, dead and buried, just as another witness to say, actually, death and pain and suffering aren't real. They would have nothing to do with a loving spirit, a loving source, a loving oneness that we truly are. Now, this takes a lot of mind training, so I would say that for most people, uh, what they do is they are continually having things pop up from the unconscious mind that, that are little threads of darkness. Uh, still the belief in death, it's a, it's a death wish that's still in the mind, and it's all suffering comes from still holding on and protecting a death wish in the mind. So, what it is, is I would say like relationships, anytime we perceive an external world, somehow that the world is outside of us, instead of just uh, unified in, we'll call it the unified field, unified awareness, the quantum field, that's all an awareness that everything is completely connected and there's nothing inside or outside. Most human beings perceive an external world and even if you are having a happy day and a mosquito comes along and bites you on the arm and you feel a little irritated at the mosquito bite, there's still an antagonism with what seems to be the skin. And you feel it emotionally. Uh, you get irritated, you get annoyed, you get itchy. And even that is still ego. Uh, even a, a mos perceiving a, an irritation with a mosquito bite. Uh, because any form of irritation and annoyance or upset, even the tiniest upset is still 
saying that ego is still rooted in the mind, in consciousness, and it has to be transcended. So I would say I work with everybody into the sense of don't try to get into mental games of, of, of perceiving suffering and trying to detach yourself from the suffering. As long as it's in your awareness, whether it's a mosquito bite or a little fatigue and discomfort, uh, tightness in the body or a little bit of worry or anxiety or whatever, don't fool yourself into thinking um, I can just try to detach from that or push it away. It's coming up into awareness for a reason to be released. And we're here to release every scrap of discomfort so that we can truly live a joyful, uh, happy, radiant life, you know, full of love extending. That's really what we're all going for. And, and it, it does take a lot of uh, discipline. I'm not trying to kid anybody by saying they can just twinkle their nose or click their fingers or put their heels together like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz and just keep clicking their heels together. I, and I'm not saying it's magic. You know, we can use it in a magical way. It, it takes prayer and meditation and a real willingness to, uh, to not hold on to any sense of personal identification. How does it happen in your world? Uh, it's, your, it's your personal experience, not the one that is theoretical, idealized, but, but the world of David today. If you look at, I don't know, let's say past number of months or year, what's happening in the emotional world? And well, people relating with still beings that surround us as we perceive them from the angle, right, of the, of the ego. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, in the in the in the past couple of weeks or months, uh, the the body of David and the 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 instrument of David has, is always seems to be used for sharing this message with large numbers of people in many countries. So I could say in the past few months, uh, there's been an experience with uh, Mexico, with all the way across to Australia, way down under over there for a couple of weeks and then back over here in Utah. And then just this past weekend, I went to a spiritual conference. I was a speaker in Las Vegas, Nevada. So let's use that as an example. David mm -hmm. hops on the plane, he goes down, he lands, and he's right smack dab in the middle of Las Vegas. He's speaking at a spiritual convention that's in a casino. Mm -hmm. So he goes in the casino with his luggage to get his very nice rooms provided and women walking around with very skimpy, not many clothes on, bringing, serving drinks, and there's there's poker, roulettes, and all types of flashing lights, and there's many, many high stimulation of lights and flashing, and women traveling around, and famous acts, uh, David Copperfield, and, and Penn and Teller, magicians, and a Beatles thing by uh, Cirque du Soleil, and big time shows, but it's massive stimulation. And I've just come from a monastery. I was in a very, very still monastery where it was so quiet you couldn't even hear an airplane come. So I've come from complete silence in rural Utah down and in right into the heart of, of Las Vegas, which they have nicknamed Sin City uh, because of all the vices of prostitution and gambling and so yeah. on and so forth. A lot of stimulus. Yeah, high stimulation. But actually, from these last 25 years of training my mind, there's no difference for me. So I come from a very still point and I go down there. Now, the people I travel with and the people I am speaking to and work with, you know, they're working with that. Uh, the main organizer of uh, my conference, he did a, a talk on the final day and he was bringing up his childhood memories of being laughed at and neglected and he was giving his talk and i could see his body was shaking as he was giving the talk and he said to start off he said i'm i'm bisexual i'm polyamorous uh, i have a female partner for 20 some years but i'm still bisexual and polyamorous and and he said all this and then during his talk he started taking he took off his hat because he said his mother always said don't wear a hat in church and then he kept taking things off he took his he kept peeling off and peeling off until he was down in his underwear addressing almost 500 people um, standing there in his underwear, talking about his body issues, talking about 
uh, sexuality, talking about the things of in his childhood that still bothered him, that he was forgiving. So how, what is the day in the life of David? Um, it, it, it seems to be like feeling completely connected with everyone and everything so that, so that there is no significant changes. There's no like surprises that come. Uh, there's nothing that, that kind of jolts me. I find, I find it all delightful. I find the stillness in the canyon in Utah delightful, but I found my entire experience of uh, Las Vegas to be absolutely delightful. I, I also am very intuitive so that when it was time for me to go to my room and meditate or be still or sleep or take a nap, I, I didn't try to fight against anything. I just flowed with it. Stimulation, stimulation, nice little nap wake up, eyes open, meeting many people, doing radio interviews, many interviews. Uh, I was very well known at this conference. So I was like, uh, because the whole conference was 500 people that are very devoted to spiritual awakening. Every time I would walk through the hall to a restaurant to go anywhere, people bringing books to me to sign from, from different countries, from Japan and whatever, lots of hugs, lots of kisses. Just along with this, the lights and the stimulation of Las Vegas, there was I was like a, a, a celebrity. I was like George Clooney, uh, like a movie star in this particular hotel because everybody there knows me from many years of work. They watch me on YouTube for many hours, hundreds of hours, and they feel like I'm in many respects like their closest friend and they haven't seen me for some of them have never met me and never hugged me or never been a ch had chance to be face to face. So they were all, it was, it was kind of a fun experience, but it what, did feel like being a rock star uh, down there. So it was all the stimulation of Vegas and a, like a rock star kind of vibe. Now I'm back, I'm back with my cats. Uh, it's, you know, the cat doesn't think I'm a celebrity. Uh, the cat, you know, it's just a simple, simple joys of life. But that's kind of what's, to give you an example, that's just what I went through. <laughs> do you do you feel triggers? I don't. I felt triggers how for so many long, years. How long have you not felt any triggers, emotional triggers at all? How long do you notice in, in your world? It's happened? been it's been quite a few years. Like I think uh, I've been at this spiritual journey probably for 30 years consciously. And I would say it goes back, um, quite a few years, it's probably been over 10 years where uh, there just has not been, uh, it triggers. It's been, I've been in more an extend mode where it's just like this love that's, that is me, that's in me, just wants to pour out like a fountain or like a Niagara Falls, it just wants to pour. And so uh, if, if I wouldn't, if I would try to isolate, it would be, I would feel tense. So I'm constantly in extend mode. So I'm traveling and I'm speaking. I'm I'm kind of in Dalai Ma, Dalai Lama mode. If we had a little mode in your in your mind where you could click into Dalai Lama mode, mm -hmm. you know, if you see Dalai Lama, he's like ha ha ha. He's he's happy, smiling. They introduced me at the conference. They said, well, they said, well, some people say he's a mystic, but the the organizer said, I don't even know if that's a word I would use. Some people say he's enlightened. He said, I don't know. He said he's happy. He's happy. Uh, he said, I can say that. Every time I look at him, he's smiling. He's just happy. So I'm kind of like a bit in Dalai Lama mode where I'm, I'm going around. And, and oftentimes I see pictures of uh, Saint Fra Pope Francis. Uh, he's a sweetie. Uh, all these popes we've had, he, he seems to be smiling so much and going to Mexico and going to the prisons and going to the poor. He's, I, I'm kind of in uh, Pope Francis mode uh, too, because I get used in that way. Do you think that if your environment or circumstantial reality would be different, let's say, for example, imagine this, we take body of David and put him in a corporate world where everybody, let, let's, let's take an extreme, everybody compete for for career role and trying to figure out how to deal with shareholders and that and, yes. and 
firings and all the all the drama of human existence especially in western society right yeah yes what do you imagine would happen to your emotional world if we really kind of honest with ourselves because i i remember time when uh it felt that everything so auspicious in my world and i never ever would have any emotional turbulences anymore and then life took turns and oh wait a minute here is emotion and here is relation to the emotion and here is experience and starting to kick in just <laughs> as you need, didn't expect it what what do you think would happen to david's emotional world well i i could say this for sure i'm glad you brought that example up because i teach like the buddha and jesus that we have to empty our mind of all roles and concepts and and off i am asked a lot can you be a ceo in the corporate world and be enlightened and i say no you cannot a ceo can never be enlightened because there's too many concepts the competition the striving for future goals the uh, shareholders all the things you mentioned are part of a, a, a self-concept of an ego concept that if you believe that that's you you bring stress uh it's just that simple so so my life has been i i did work in in uh business and i worked in different things like i'm sure you did we you know we've done that and we've had our stressful times uh doing that too we could say surely we did and then I started to question competition. I, I was a tennis instructor and a tennis player. I started to use the tennis more as like a Tai Chi. Uh, I started to use tennis as a movement um, to discipline for my mind. I still love tennis, but I, I used it that way. I, I also got out of competition entirely. So even when I'm down at a spiritual community, you know, and there's 30 other teachers, I'm going around and hugging all 30 teachers because I don't see myself in competition with them around books or workshops or streaming things or YouTube channels or whatever. I've, I've released the belief in competition. So I would say that uh, that's what happens. Like the body of David just went down to Las Vegas, which can be a very uh, competitive, some people would say tempting place beautiful women all around shows all around people saying come here and giving you free samples as you That's walk good. by come come yes <laughs> very very like that but but there was a time probably where that would have been alluring to me uh very alluring or it, i might have been tempted or whatever but but not anymore it's actually for these 10 whatever years that since I've been out traveling and I had this deep enlightenment experience, then, then actually it, it's just very much all the same to me. It's the whole, everything feels the same. It's what's coming out. So I would say, I always teach you have to bring the illusions in your mind to the truth of oneness. And you can't bring the light into the world. And some people believe that you can just take a light being. They say, how would Jesus do in a corporation? Well, he... He, he definitely, from his teachings, he really wouldn't have much to do with the corporation. He could still be there and be like the loving presence. Uh, he could just be glowing and shining and moving around. And, you know, he could still be, seem to be there, like he seemed to be in this world. And he was still talking and, and eating and out and walking among the people. And that's the way my life is. I'm very friendly. I just don't believe in any distinctions anymore. I can have as much fun with a businessman or an atheist or an agnostic as somebody who's a Buddhist or a Christian uh, or a Muslim because I, I don't have these categories in my mind. It's just all love and light. So I do have a lot of fun with everybody wherever I go, but I, I, would, not, I would not be drawn to take a job because I'm, I'm the prana and the, and the mana from heaven is so strong in me that I have no attraction to uh, enter into a contract, you know, to like in corporate, you know, right. there's no draw to it anymore. So when we speak about compassion, there is a lot uh, in it around relating to another beings as, as they are, as their awareness is, 
as the circumstances, experiences of the circumstances are, and so on and so forth. And if we take a, let's say, for example, scenario a little bit more intermediate, a bit more moderate, I'm not talking about the, mm. the huge corporate world of competition no. as extreme example, but let's say, for example, let's look around us. In order for us to have this uh, opportunity to, for, for enjoyment in life, we have, let's say, a house to live in. This house was built by someone. In the process of building, at least how the, the, the universe on the earth works right now, it's usually companies build this house. Right? There is a company produces material, there is a company that build the house, there is someone to manage it. Whether it's corporation or not, competition or not, it's irrelevant. Let's say entrepreneurs create something. Yeah. Now, for entrepreneur that creates something, there is need in navigation of this realities of human perceived and built by the mind realities, right? In these realities, there is still interaction between people that have their own wounds that didn't they didn't heal by transcending the ego. And so you bounce between entities, humans that that bring their own unconscious and um let's say trigger unconscious within you that when the ego is still alive the identification with the body mind and the identity is still alive so so in, in kind of average common denominator of human life right so 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 when we look at compassion and relating where would you be coming from here so here is a being he she build something for the for the good of another and for the the comfort of their own family and so on and so forth so so there is a human life average per se uh semi-awakened human life and there is emotion and there is interaction with other emotions and triggers and there is so much of it that's what people come to me very often it's just there's just so much of these energies and emotions and events that i would rather not even participate but almost feel like i'm i'm dragged into it into meetings that i don't need into conflicts that i don't want to be part of yet i have to participate and remain still and peaceful and compassionate but i feel like my energy exhausted even to be compassionate because it's feel there's so much unconscious behavior, so much unkind and humane very often behavior. And of course, it's all labels and it all depends from where you perceive, yet it's almost, I would say from again, from observations, it's easy to perceive from the right angle, more awake angle when your, uh, your emotional world is a little bit at peace. But when the triggers happen, the immersion in emotions happen, you kind of get driven into unconscious side of, of human experience. And now the conversation of the, about the compassion becomes very relevant, more relevant than, than ever. What's yeah, your yeah. opinion on that one? Yeah, yeah I, followed I followed a teaching, a teaching where it showed, showed me that, me that the entire cosmos and all the images of the world are are projections. So, for example, uh, what you're describing is kind of like the human experience. Is you're almost caught between two worlds. You're you're caught between a, a very competitive, materialistic ego world, and then there's the spiritual realm. And you're like describing almost like a fallen angel. We'll say mm -hmm. the angel is back in the light and love and wings and can fly anywhere and yes, yeah, it's very, very nice. It's very nice. And then when you kind of get in between the worlds, then the, then it gets to be uh, the struggle. So I've come from a place where I was told by Jesus. I, I just told the conference. I stood up in front of 500 people and I said, I've heard there's people called devotees. Uh, I said, I'm a devotee of Jesus Christ. So I'm a devotee. So what I do is I follow the master and the master tells me, you can't compromise between the spiritual light and love of heaven and this world. Like enti this entire world is made out of the fabric of guilt, the fabric of pain and suffering. Even the pleasure, even the good aspects of this world, Jesus taught me, even the, the positive ones are just as tempting as the negative ones because you can go for a positive for a while and then boom, the drama of the negative just comes and gets you and takes you down. So, exactly, just to show you how awakened yes, you are. <laughs> exactly. So, it, so, so in following the master, he basically, I was saying, well, 
what are you telling me? Then I should just drop the world. And he said, that's exactly what I'm telling you. And I said, so you're going to call me out of the world? And he said, yes, not, not your body will still look like it's there, but your mind can't be there. Your mind can't be in to competition and fighting and conflict, superior, inferior, better than, worse than. He said, there's no way that you can be happy and peaceful all the time if you plug into that crazy world of opposites. I was just talking to my friend Nikita. Right before I'm talking to Olga from Ukraine, I'm talking to Nikita from <laughs> Moscow. And uh, Nikita was saying, oh, is Olga, is she, does she speak Russian? Do you need a Russian translator? I said, no, no, Olga's fine with English. But I said, you know, we were talking about that. And she said, oh, Ukraine, they're really into uh, non-duality. And uh, I'm into non-duality. I'm into to love and oneness. But I do see that this world of opposites, that if you try to partake in it, if you try to, if soon as you split uh, the world in any way, or you split even consciousness up into observer observed, that's two. If you split consciousness up into the subject and the object, that's two. And everybody from Einstein and Niels Bohr and all the quantum physicists and all the mystics and saints, including Jesus, Buddha, Krishnamurti, everybody's telling them the same thing. Krishnamurti mm -hmm. said, I am the world and the world is me. He was yes. saying it's all one thing. And as soon as we break it into two, we cannot avoid conflict as long as we believe in two. But if we experience the one, then we need to radiate the one just radiate it always. Wherever we seem to be, we're just radiating love, radiating the oneness. So I, I can relate to what you were just describing because that was the majority of my life on earth was, was that. And now, am I loving? Yes. Am I gentle? Yes. Am I compassionate? Yes. But it comes from the core of my being. It's, it doesn't come from David. Uh, David is is like a, a puppet that's used as part of the transmission. But it's not even David. It's, it goes way beyond David. And that, to me, is the, is the joy of it all. Because I, like, for example, how does that play out? Well, I haven't worked a job uh, in many years. So, so, in other words, I'm never waiting to get paid. Um, because I'm in give mode. I'm in, I'm in Dalai Lama mode where I'm give, 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 give. And I'm not looking to get anything back from the world. I'm not looking for a paycheck. I'm not looking for this and that. Do I still go to houses? I go to hotels. I go to houses. The money just kind of flows like energy, almost like a current of energy. But it's not. I'm not identified with it coming this way or going that way. Uh, you know, it's, it's, there's no need in it. There's no kind of sense of need or lack. It just kind of swirls around as in perfect use by the spirit. But I don't have any identification with it. Um, do I still brush my teeth sometimes? Do I still take a bath, a shower occasionally? Do I still walk and talk uh, and smile and laugh and hug and kiss, hug and kiss? Yes, 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 I do. Uh, but basically, I don't put my time and, and my thoughts into it. You know, it's like it feels like it's involuntary. It's just it's just happening and I'm just I'm just part of a an experience, but I don't try to figure it out. It's almost like like in a in a river being like a twig, a little twig from a tree that's caught in a river. And the, the river's gonna take the twig all the way to the ocean. And the twig doesn't really have much say in it at all. It may get caught along the shore a few times, and it may get, it may flip over some rocks. But basically, it's gonna, it's just gonna get carried as far as it's supposed to be carried. And that's how I feel my life is now. I'm like a twig in the river, and I'm quite happy with the river actually. So I'm not even trying to buck fight the river at all, really. <laughs> And again, as we, as we bring back ourselves to the conversation of compassion and look at lives of people who were not blessed with insight, even experience of awakening, it's, it's just an experience really, yes. right? Yes. Well, just simply experience that gives you a lot of insight and, and shift your angle of perception. So, yes. so the biases and habits that you had before and all the patterns they still can remain to a degree, yet there will be huge transition to 
the level of immersion in in the life of the body now as we look at majority of of lives uh, I would say majority simply based on, for example, my own experience. You know, people come and you and you hear what they are, and 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 you and you relate to their suffering and do your best to to give them other perspectives and uh, and other angle from which perception can be happening, even from where they are now, their level of awareness, their level of experience, and so on and so forth, and. Then, then, then the conversation even often has to be different conversation. I can talk about the unity consciousness and non-dual uh, and so on and so forth. And unless you experience it, the theoretical understanding gives you absolutely no validity. There is, it's not valid. You can't even understand, right? Because the mind that created the problem cannot understand the other <laughs> reality in which this problem doesn't exist. So, so you almost have to be able to extend your compassion to the other mechanism of of trans, um, of giving and trans, transferring the the information and the understanding inside experience. So in my world, the only way I can give to person who never understood what I would want to transfer is through physical somatic experience of the body. For example, you know, you, you help person to drop out of the mind. You help them to relax in the body. You help them to become completely present to the sensation that points to emotion and track it back to what the thought would bring. You know, the basics of tracking down this immersion in reality and, and this identification with the body. So talking about very high concept is not really helping because there is no relating to that more than just intellectually relating and wishful thinking. Oh, I wish I could experience it like you. I wish I could experience it like David or someone else or, or Buddha or Jesus. But it's not my experience, they would say. It's just not my experience. All I know is I'm in pain because, I don't know, my husband is drinking, my, there's no paycheck, and I don't have, let's say, for example, David trust in the grace of the river in which we are flowing, that abundance will be happening, and I cannot just make up that trust, it's not within me, right? So you kind of, the, the compassion and, and, and teaching of compassion to yourself and to other, uh, for their world to make, to, to, to have a difference, has to, has to happen um, on a little bit different level than, than non-dual, for them, idealistic reality. Right? Well, I, th I think what I've experienced is when I'm in this glorious oneness and non-dual, then, then it comes out of me in so many ways, almost like the sun sends its, its rays of light um, all over the solar system. Basically, all the planets are blessed by the rays of the sun. Uh, the entire solar system. And the way it comes out for me is I, I use movies. Everybody likes movies. Everybody feels movies are entertaining, relaxing. I use movies as parables to teach them, while they're relaxed, to join with them. I, I make a, a whole pathway to God that's never been seen before. Movie watching to enlightenment. Mm -hmm. uh, and and, uh, and mwge.org. Very deep, very profound. But I reach them with the movies. So I reach them with the mu movies and I take their hand and I say, come along with me. We're on this ride together. Come and join me. And people have e mystical experiences just watching movies with me, like ayahuasca or ecstasy or something. They're just watching a movie. They're just watching movies and they're having those experiences. I use movies. I use experientials. I use meditation. When I'm with friends, I'll be rubbing their back, hugging them, playful, affectionate. It's very, like you said, it's very much, it feels like the body. People love to be hugged. They mm -hmm. love to be squeezed. They love touch. They love affection. It's, it's, it's that compassion just radiates out through the body. My hands are, are active that way. Also, uh, I, I have a lot of interactive courses. So online people have to participate. It's not just reading. Uh, it's very audio, very visual. I use a lot like you do videos. People mm -hmm. love to watch Olga. They like to see your face. They like to see your smile. They like to see your sparkly eyes. They would rather have that than maybe read a book by Olga. They would rather that's watch why a, Olga is a, a book. <laughs> yes, that's right. You don't need to. You don't need to because you just sparkle. 
So I agree that um, we have to, like I was just in Los Angeles and uh, this guy met me and he was, he had a magazine, but he said, I don't even know if I'm going to publish another thing. And he was having some health issues, but I stayed with him. We talked, we left. He said, can I interview you for my magazine? Maybe I'll make another copy. And I said, that's fine. So he does. So then all over Los Angeles on, in stores for free is the magazine. Uh, yeah, the it just goes all over the place. But see, I just happen to be in the spot where he's like, he likes me. He wants to interview me. He's not even sure if he's going to make the magazine. But then after he interviews me, he says, whole person is my magazine and I want to put mm -hmm. you on the cover. So now I've got friends in Los Angeles saying, oh, my God, I saw you at this this shop and this health food place and this gym and UCLA over on the campus of the UCLA University. I'm all over the place. I didn't try to do that, but mm -hmm. it reaches people for in a in a simple way. And I totally agree with you that that we can't think of it in terms of higher consciousness and lower consciousness because because we have to be be the demonstration. We have to be the example. We can't change anybody's mind. We're not trying to recruit oh, anybody or convince and really the low and higher consciousness, right? All there is is the consciousness. The conscious, right. And we're, we're, these forms. Yes. And we're just enjoying being in touch with that. And then you're happy and you radiate that happiness. And then maybe people will only see the sparkle in your eye and they'll say, Wow, I have hope that you know I what? Can do what that. I want people to see also, I want them to understand I do have pain, I do have fears, I do have all the human emotions, but it does not make it real. I mean, to the degree real to to immerse in the suffering and believe that suffering is all there is about life. Even when we talk about non-duality, some people say, oh, there is a duality and there is non-duality. No, the whole point of non-duality, that all dual expression is it. That's how the one looks. The one doesn't look just love and peace. The one looks like everything in front of our face and everything within us. The one looks like fear today and anger tomorrow and joy day after and, and sparkles in the eyes and tears. It all the contrast that constitutes the one, isn't it? And there's a beauty of the one in it and the compassion to another being is only possible when this contrast exists so we can experience contrast at least through little, little glimpse of this, this human experience so then we can extend the love that just flowing because we understand it not intellectually but experientially, we know it. We've been there. We can relate, isn't it so? Well, I think it's it's a step. Like if you know, it's like the five five blind guys who go up to it. They're all blind, and they go to an elephant. Somebody grabs the tail. Somebody grabs the the foot. Somebody grabs the the trunk. You know, they all say it's different. Everybody, they're all blind, but they all grab a different part of the elephant, and they say it's different. And I I think the elephant is still the elephant, but it's like you're they're getting different aspects of it so this is the way i would say it when the mind falls asleep and forgets love and oneness it's in a in an experience of multiplicity differences duality you know it's it's in the experience of many and many is not one one is one many is many but when the mind is asleep that's what it experiences earth or many planets in this in the cosmos is that way and it has an unconscious mind that Carl Jung called the shadow that mm -hmm. needs to come up into awareness. Now, we have to allow, this is where our, you and I are agreeing, we have to allow every emotion, every thought, every belief to come up. We can't judge uh, m emotions as good or bad, right or wrong. It's not, we're not going to heal if we keep judging. If, if I say, oh, that's a bad emotion and I push it back down, I'll never be healed of it. I'll, it'll never come up uh, and, and be free. Mm -hmm. So I would say that the, the spirit in, in each of us has to use contrast to start to, to work with us. Why does, he, why does the spirit use a contrast? Because feeling love feels better experientially than fear. It, love is, oh, it's not, I'm not talking romantic love or sexual, I'm talking in your heart where you just feel oh like 
everything's beautiful, everything's perfect. That feels better than fear and guilt and pain and suffering. So the spirit uses contrast because we've got so much repression and denial going on to bring everything up. And then when everything comes up, we have opportunities to forgive or release the, the, the negativity, the judgments, the attack. We, we keep clearing our mind and clearing our mind. And, and that's why Jesus said, blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. He didn't say, blessed are the mixed of heart, for they shall see God. He used the word pure. And we know that purification takes a devotion. It takes a discipline. We're all going through a purification process. It's, it's beautiful. I would say as we go through the purification process, we do transcend all duality. And not to say that duality was good or bad or right or wrong, but it's what we were dealing with. And, and I'm saying we're dealing with the unconscious mind. But the goal of spirituality is to be fully conscious. We don't want to be split. Oh, I'm half conscious and half unconscious. Mm -hmm. That doesn't sound very holistic or healing. So, so I, I have a great uh, love for everyone and everything. Uh, when people are, I was with some people at a dinner table and this one woman told me, oh, I didn't even want to see you at this conference because I didn't like you. <laughs> I was not going to hear you and speak, but now I'm sitting with you and I did go hear something you said. And she said, no, nah, I'm, I'm going to talk to you now at least. And so she's telling me her story and all this and this. On the other side, another friend of mine, she starts crying, 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 crying. She's going through so much emotion. So I said to the one, okay, time out here. I'll, I interrupt your story here because I need to go over. I need to go hug this one over here and I'll come back. I'll be back, but I just have the time out here. So I go over here and hug and, and work with her. And then she stops crying. She says, oh, thank you. Oh, I feel so much better. Okay, good. I'm over here. You know, you just flow where where it's helpful. You just want to be helpful. You want to be friendly. You You want to offer whatever wants to come through you and you don't judge it i don't if somebody's crying that's that's okay it, it has to be okay at the moment yes it's right there it's presenting itself and then over here this one's saying i don't like you but i want to get to know you better okay then that's good too but but you see you kind of just flow along with that and and don't judge that's the main thing i i really don't judge anything. I, I'm really not even judging people in, in consciousness as being higher or lower because we're all the same. We're really all the same underneath it all. And and we just need to let all emotions kind of flow through whatever they are and not judge them. We we let them pass, you know, without judging them as, as good or bad or right or wrong. So to me, that's, uh, that's why I can go to everybody, cheers. You know, I'm saying, always saying cheers and go for it and good on you and good day mate like they say in australia good day mate and i'm very friendly with people because because i love them my heart i really do and the reason why i wanted to talk to uh, today about compassion because it seems like compassion is the only solution for anything for anything at all really compassion mm -hmm. is the solution your yes. pain you have pain compassion to yourself and to other who perceivably hurt you is the solution yes. well, your Mercy. child your Love. child is misbehaving compassion is compassion. the way yeah. someone wants some uh, spiritual growth because they, they 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 cannot find what they want otherwise and they try to escape from this life and compassion is solution and someone yeah. angry at you and compassion is solution yeah. and someone wants bad to your family unfortunately compassion is solution everywhere there is no <laughs> yes <laughs> but the compassion is not the solution but the trick of it the, the the compassion as i see it in a lot of beings who want to be compassionate it's not something that happened automatic because i want to be compassionate i decided so there is a practice to that and there is yes. an inner path to it through clearing your misperceptions about the world your your part in it the part of the world in you you ha you, you have to be so committed to to compassionate path then it's it's happening beyond just decision because decision is still the work of the mind compassion is not the work of the mind i would also i would probably say compassion is is the work of the heart more if right. i would 
if I would yeah. go that route, right? Even though it's not exactly the same either, because heart is just the, is, is just the organ in the body. <laughs> but it's a path. It's not something that you can just decide, well, let, let me be compassionate now. It just doesn't work like that. The mind is not ruling the, 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 the path of compassion. It just doesn't. It's almost... It's beyond the mind. It's only when the mind is not engaged and compassion truly happening because there is no separation then. The mind, the, the, the work of the mind is to separate. It's to fragment, Comp compartmentalize. I never can pronounce that word, right? <laughs> <laughs> you did. It's very good. <laughs> you did very well. <laughs> it's a path, right? It's a path. It's a practice. Mm -hmm. So, and here it comes, the, the compassion is only, it's the only solution to any conflict in the world, any conflict within us, interpersonal conflict, compassion is only solution, and it's not automatic solution, it's not intellectual solution, it's a commitment to a path that has to be nurtured again and again and despite because it's always despite, right? The practice mm. is always despite, despite the fact that, oh, I would rather do something else right now. And I would rather feel something else right now because sometimes anger and, and feeling righteous feels much stronger in the moment than compassion that almost sometimes could feel for some week. Oh, I feel compassion, but I want to fight. I'm strong. I know better. I have right views and you have wrong, right? So the compassion is the practice of its own isn't it it is i think that's that's it we're we're sounding the note for devote your life to compassion when you say well okay I, that's a part of my life but but i want to be ambitious well can we look and explore that if you still have ambition you have ambition for better more in the future you will be ruthless you will be competitive you will have fight there's fight that comes with ambition. If you have future goals and I want a better life, a better house, a better this and this, and I'll work and I'll fight and I'll do whatever I can to achieve it, that doesn't go with compassion. Compassion is, it, it does take a discipline, it takes your full focus. We're not trying to fool anybody and say it's like a little light switch. We just, oh, okay, I'll be compassionate. Just flick the light switch. No, you have to you have to give your heart and soul, you have to give everything to that, you have to make it the top priority above everything else. And that's why I love that when people come and they say, oh, I'm sorry, you're so busy, I don't want to interrupt you. I said, no, come in. Uh, they say, oh, please, I, I don't want to bother you. No, you're not bothering me, come here. Uh, I don't want to disturb you. Oh, no, you're not disturbing me at all, come here. Come, 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 come. Because compassion can say come. Compassion has right. all the all the time in the world because right now is all the time in the world. It's 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 not on some kind of line of scarcity where it's like go away and come back and this and this. So beautiful. You you give your heart of compassion and you've got like you were saying, you got a, a pretty full schedule this afternoon and I just got back from Las Vegas, so I'm do washing clothes, packing, doing these things and and I got up, and it's here we are. We both quickly found our time to join. And then once I could get the settings in my computer to work, uh, we have our shared compassion is right there. But yeah. because it's it's our life, it it it's important yes, it to us. Yes, it, it is. is. David. I love you so much. I always uh, enjoy <laughs> our meetings of the realities that merge for a moment and dance for a moment and share for a moment and then part away to, to do our work in the world in our own little ways. And um, yes. I'm very, very grateful. Uh, thank you, Olga. I feel the same way. That it doesn't even matter whether it's we've talked for days or weeks or months when we join together our our compassionate heart is so strong that we we recognize it and it's yes. just like it's there forever and ever and ever yeah. much love to you um i'm wishing you well nothing really what to wish to to, to someone who has everything right <laughs> thank you so much for your time and um I know I will see you again and we will have some sort of chit chat again and share little pieces of our little wisdom and our heart with the world. <laughs> yes. That's what we do. <laughs> big, big hugs and kisses. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.